Welcome to episode 192. Today on Book Chat, I am interviewing audiobook narrator Jennifer Ledford. Come along as she shares with us some of her experiences while recording Out of the Soliant Planet by Robert Crose. Today's episode is brought to you by Audiobooks.com. New customers get one free audiobook when using our promo code AUDIOSHELF. You just need to enter the code AUDIOSHELF on the sign-up page, then click Apply, then fill out the rest of your account info. Support this podcast by using our code AUDIOSHELF and get your first audiobook free. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Tamara Ford, and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Here on Book Chat, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, book recommendation lists, interviews, and more. If you'd like to check out book reviews and other bookish posts, please visit the blog at shelfaddiction.com. Let me tell you about today's guest. Jennifer D. Ledford was a born performer, acting and singing since she was a young girl. She has been honing her character skills over her entire life, from acting out Mighty Python sketches with her older brother, to several years of speech and debate tournaments, and theater school, to chasing her four sons around the house using made-up personas. She has developed a great flexibility in her voice. Jennifer brings a vast array of tones and timbers and a keen sense of humor to her performances as she strives to bring each writer's creation to life. All of Jennifer's social media links are below in the show notes, so if you'd like to connect, you know where to find her. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like and share it. Show your support by rating the podcast and leaving a five-star review of Shelf Addiction on your favorite podcast directory. It seems super simple, and it is, but it also really helps me out. Don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Sunday and Wednesday. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Shelf Addiction. If you'd like to email in feedback or questions, please please do, or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. I look forward to hearing from you. All of my contact information is below in the show notes. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's nice to talk to you. How are you doing? I am very excited to be doing this. I'm a little nervous about it. It's my first podcast ever. It's a little different than an audio book since I don't have uh, someone else's words to sustain me. True. I'm very excited to be the first one. I love that when that happens. It's my favorite thing. Cool. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So I've got some questions for you and you're going to have some answers for me and it's super easy. So you ready to jump into it? Absolutely. All right. So let's start off like kind of high level. Tell me, how did you get into narrating audiobooks? It is a strange and backward story. I had a I've always been in acting live performances since I was five years old. I had stumbled into a few commercials a few years back, but uh, hadn't really considered audiobooks. And I made friends with an author on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And we're just horsing around, you know, getting to know each other. I listened to him on some podcasts. Like, well, I know what your voice sounds like. You want to hear what my voice sounds like? So I sent him one of my commercials. He's like, ah, want to do an audiobook? And the rest is history. It, uh... Mm -hmm. It was just, I think within, what, two weeks, I had run around and spent about $3,000 on gear and jumped in and had to learn the editing software while I was doing it. And uh, that was about this time last year. That was the first one I did for him, iRobot. And uh, Wow. Yeah, so this, it was kind of accidental, but I'm thrilled. I I wish someone had pointed this out to me 20 years ago because I, I would love to have started I always wanted to be in voice acting, but I've been, you know, busy raising my kids and I studied science in college. So it wasn't something that I even thought about. And, mm-hmm. uh, but mm-hmm. I'm, I love it. So how steep was that learning curve for you? Um, the, the acting part of it, that wasn't difficult because of the acting background. Mm. And uh, I did a lot of competitive prose and poetry reading in high school, but the tech side of it uh, about gave me a breakdown. Um, just, yeah. I, I went with pro tools, which apparently it's like, I'm using the space shuttle to, I don't know, <laughs> send a postcard and yeah. uh, my, my sons are musicians. So our, they're one of their teachers is also a producer and he encouraged me to get it because hopefully they'll start using it for music. But, mm-hmm. uh, it was, it was very steep, especially learning the editing and, uh, getting, yeah. you know, getting it processed just right for audible. 
Yeah, that's great. Because I understand. I mean, as a podcaster, an indie podcaster, I don't have a producer to help me out with the editing. I do it myself. So I understand that editing life. It's it's not a joke. Mm. Yeah, the, the talking part is the easy part. Indeed. The talking part is the fun part. And then comes the editing, which is like another beast in itself. So. Absolutely. What do you do when you're not narrating these awesome books? Well, I have four sons. Uh, they are, f- how old are they now? 14 to 20. And uh, we're homeschoolers, so they are always here. Except, you know, the old one, thank- oldest one is earning some money, thank God, so he's not always home. Uh, <laughs> we also have three animals, so there's a lot of very prosaic house cleaning, domestic engineering. Um, I also do uh, leather and resin jewelry, and I have mm-hmm. an Etsy shop love to read and uh you know netflix british mysteries on netflix is my guilty passion so uh that's pretty much it i used to make jewelry i tell you i used to make a ton of jewelry and i used to have an etsy shop it's still there but i don't sell on it anymore well etsy isn't what it used to be (laughs) yeah it's not so i'm like it's more uh, well we can get into that another time (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See, it's transformed. And then I love Netflix here on Show Addiction Podcast. We're always talking about TV when we're not talking about books and audiobooks. It's oh. a problem. <laughs> love it. Oh. Especially British stuff. My husband says I must have been British in a previous life. So, well, I was, I actually, it was funny. I thought I was German. And I did the DNA thing and found out that I'm 70% made in the UK. And I'm like, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. So it must be Maybe I should do me. the DNA thing too. <laughs> <laughs> so since we're here talking about audiobooks, yes. and I know that you are an audiobook narrator, or do you wish to be called a voice actor instead? I'm actually fine. To me, I mean, at the moment, I'm, you know, since audiobook narration is 100% of what I'm doing. Uh, the main reason I include voice actor, like in my description on Twitter and things like that, is because there's, to me, there's two main styles of narration. And if there mm-hmm. are actual official names for them, I don't know them because I'm still pretty new to this. But to me, you've got your classic, like your ordinary parent reading a book to their child with a nice amount of expression, you know, a, a pleasant voice to listen to, and you're just kind of drifting, listening. And that's a, that's a great narration. I think a lot of people go for that. And then there's me, Mm -hmm. and I'm more, like, with that first book, I did 37 different characters. Wow. Including a parrot, because my author is insane. (laughs) Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, and and I I gave every one of them a different voice. I gave them accents, and I'm I'm not, of course, not the only narrator who does that. There are plenty of them. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think when you're really giving them that full tilt characterization where it sounds like you've got different people in the booth, that's a different style. I don't know what you would call it, but, you know, that's why I threw voice actor in there that I would love to do animation someday. Oh, that's awesome. So I've got to know with that many characters, how do you keep them straight? I mean, as you come back to record new segments and new parts, how do you not mix them up? Usually it wasn't a problem. There were, I think there was one character that showed up like that first book that showed up in chapter four. And I didn't realize, even though I had read the book before, but I read very quickly and I didn't realize that character was coming back about 12 chapters later. So I had to go back and listen to what I had done Mm -hmm. and get it back. But, you know, most of them, you've got your main characters and they're showing up in every chapter. Like um, with the Starship Grifters books, you've got, my name is Sasha. I am an android. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's a robot. It's easy. And then you've got Rex Nilo, wheeler dealer (laughs) of the galaxy. Yeah. So, and I know them so well now they're alternate personalities. (laughs) But, um... Most of the characters, I told he delighted in giving me characters that only had one line and then you never saw them again. Oh, and I'm like, I mean, in some ways it's easy because I don't have to keep, but at the same time, I put a lot of pressure on myself to make it them all sound different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, Robert, you're killing me, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how do you work out how each one sounds? Like, do you, after you read the book, how do you know, you know, obviously a robot sounds like a robot, but I'm sure even a robot has its mm-hmm. own special sound because it's a special robot. How do you figure that out? Um, if, you know, if he gives me any clues, like there's one, and I, I in this one it was really hard too because I, I strained my voice doing it. The um, 
captain of the Malarkian police, Hannes Vlack, uh, Robert describes him shrieking. And he actually has a very high voice. Mm -hmm. So that was a particular challenge, but he gave me something to go on. Most of them, he doesn't really tell me anything. I mean, if they're a small character, you know, we tend to associate higher pitched voices with smaller creatures Mm -hmm. and deeper voices. I had one, (laughs) one character in that first book, Donnie, he's absolutely enormous and he's very um, limited in his intelligence. So for that one, I basically went, do you remember the abominable from the Bugs Bunny cartoon? Yeah. 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 So he's kind of like that. <laughs> um, Rex is not a friend, but Sasha, you are my friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and, I'll, and what's, I wish I almost need to do video because it's very physical. Like, there's one one character, Pepper. Hi, my name's Pepper Melange. And when I'm doing Pepper, I, like, carry my body in a whole different way. Because Pepper is so much sexier than I am. Are you holding a fake cigarette right now? As you do Pepper? No, but that's... <laughs> that would be a good idea. I think generally I'm probably thinking more like a brandy. Ah, okay. Or maybe... <laughs> Maybe maybe a martini. But yeah, she's because he describes her and she actually has her own following. Mm. I'll, I'll see where um, uh, some of his readers on Twitter and they're like, we need more pepper. <laughs> but- <laughs> well, you know, readers fall in love with characters. They really do. Mm-hmm. And I, I like I would like to be pepper because, you know, she's very smart and she's very sexy. And, you know, she's a con artist and a, a thief. She's got a very exciting life. Oh, fancy. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I have to get some spandex the next time. <laughs> she sounds like she should be holding a martini for sure. She sounds very James Bond, but not. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So is she your favorite character of all time that you've narrated or do you have another one? Ooh. So, oh, let me think about that. So far. Um... She's she's definitely very high up there. I mean, I love I love Rex and Sasha, but um, also in the in the first book, and I think he's coming back in the next book. There's this little mutant robot that uh, Donnie puts together out of about six arms and a, a couple of feet. He he kind of scrabbles around on the floor, mm. and so I I modeled because he's terrifying to look at. He's actually very sweet, but he's he's like a little robot mutant monster. And uh, and Sasha thinks he's an abomination at first. And I, so I modeled him after um, Andy Serkis's Gollum. So, you know, he's going, Daddy knows. Daddy knows what it is. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that voice. So I, I, I had a lot of. <laughs> that voice. It also <laughs> reminds me of like the goblins in the labyrinth. I instantly thought of that. I don't know why. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was funny. That one I did that years ago because I've always done voices. I, my brother raised me on Monty Python and he would, you know, I had to get everything just so or he would be on my case. Mm-hmm. And uh, so like when I read The Hobbit to my kids. And I would, it was before the movies, I think. And I was doing, you know, is it crunchy? <laughs> is it tasty? Mm-hmm. And then I'm in Target with my, t- he was two, my youngest at the time. He's in the cart saying that to himself very loudly. <laughs> we got a lot of stares. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he did saying, is it crunchy? Is it tasty? Like, oh, what? Is it tasty? <laughs> Can we eat it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you then say to whoever is looking at your child a little oddly, hey, it's from a book. I don't know what's going on. Well, <laughs> generally, because I mean, I could there. That's a whole nother podcast because I have the four boys. Two of them are autistic. They're they're um, they are a very interesting bunch. They're pretty friendly. And uh, honestly, most of the time, if we get attention in public, I just like to smile sweetly and say we're homeschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that might just tell that's. Know. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. Oh goodness. They haven't been socialized. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, you are so funny. I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'm having so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. With as you narrate tons of audiobooks, I would love to know: Is there like yes. an author on your wish list that you really want to do 
a narration for them for their book? Oh, I I was pondering that when you said it. There is, it's funny because they're for different reasons. Like I would love to do a book for Mark Halprin. Are you familiar with him? I'm not. What does he write? Okay, uh, the they made a movie of one of them, The Winter's Tale, but I I didn't see the movie because the book is you know probably about. 800 pages long and you can't turn an 800 page novel into a good movie Mm -hmm. but uh he writes these incredibly lush they're almost homeric with this these descriptive passages that are just pure poetry and uh he's got fantastical elements a few of them are set in like new york maybe about 100 years ago Mm -hmm. uh he's got one set in brazil with this man who likes to beat up people who are drinking coffee (laughs) And uh, you you go th- well you go through the whole book and he's had all these adventures and you finally find out at the end why he hates coffee so much and and you'll be crying it's he just, oh no it's dreadful huh oh no well it's his books are just that beautiful and they're they really are masterpieces I don't I think the only reason maybe he's not more well known is because they're so bloody long oh. but uh, just he's he's an exquisite writer so that would be it would be exhausting but it would be just so satisfying mm-hmm. to read something like that out loud. Yeah. But uh, from another standpoint, I would love to do PG Woodhouse because he's so funny. Mm. Mm-hmm. So the, now you're familiar with him. I don't, I actually, honestly, I don't read a lot of humor. So Ooh. yeah. Well, if you ever need brain candy, PG, I'm sure you've heard of Hitchhiker's Guide, right? I have. Yes. Okay. This author is Douglas Adams said PG Woodhouse was the finest comic author of the century. Huh. And so that's that's high praise. But he writes, well, you've heard of uh, Jeeves, when people say, oh, you know, once around the park, Jeeves, yeah. and then back home for tea. Okay, that's where Jeeves came from. He's a P.G. Woodhouse creation of this butler who knows everything and keeps his protege out of trouble. Wow. And okay. it's so warped. Hmm. They are. He wrote about 100 books, and they're all just insane. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I could, I can't even imagine. There would be so many that I would love to do, but I think those were two that sprung to the top of my mind oh so when it comes to genres of narrating is like humor where you gravitate toward most or do you like that best um you know i have right now i'm not sure i've only i've done two of the humorous Mm sci-fi for both in the same the starship grifter series by robert cruzy and um and the sample that you're going to play is from the most recent one out of the soylent planet Humor is fun, and I think because I am naturally zany, um, it's, I want to say it's easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I did a City of Sand for him, which was completely different. It's much more of a, it's a sci-fi n- mystery uh, set in, New, was it New Mexico? And so there's almost no humor whatsoever. There's, there's a death, there's grieving there's violence. There's a lot of profanity. Sorry, mom. And um, it, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the challenge of it, but it was a little, it was a lot more intense. And, you know, I'm still waiting to see how it's received. It's gotten a good review so far, but uh, it, it just came out about, what, a week ago. So okay. um, I'm, I'm, let's just say I'm not quite sure what my genre is yet because I need to do more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So do you think that those type of audiobooks are more challenging just because of the seriousness of the subject or what makes them more challenging? I think I probably put more pressure on myself with the more serious ones. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just something about being playful, you know, because it's a, it's a very playful household. And uh, so I'm just used to that where... Um, um, I feel like without the all the comical voices and the different, you know, puns and all the stuff that's going on, because those books are hilarious. The, the, Robert Robert has a real gift for that kind of warped humor. Yeah. With all of that taken away, it's much more like you're on a stage with no props. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I I think it's a little uh, it's a great challenge, but it's just a little more naked feeling. Yeah. So, and the city of sand was also a ch- the main character's a man. It's in third person though, so it was okay. If it were first person, obviously I couldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, to act what he's going through without making it female, okay, you know, yeah, because like when he's grieving, when he's angry, you know, not to be stereotypical, but you know, men have a different way. Mm-hmm. 
some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get in any trouble here. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they express themselves differently than a woman does. So I had to make sure to, like, really rope everything in. Yeah. And uh, so it was it was cool. And I got to speak Spanish for that one. Ooh, so. <laughs> fun. Did you, do you already know Spanish? Or did you kind of just try to sound Spanish while reading Spanish? No, I know some Spanish. I took a few years in high school, and I, I have a good accent. And so she spoke Spanish, this one character. She did speak in Spanish some, and then the rest of the time I had to give her an accent. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was – but I, I lived in El Paso for five years, so I, I heard a lot. Yeah of that to go with. Now the next book that I'm doing for him, the dream of the iron dragon, that one is, I'm going to be doing a lot of old Norse. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, yeah, which is very different yeah. from uh, Spanish. So I, sure. luckily there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos of a professor. Um, Jackson Crawford is his name. And he does a lot of lessons in how to speak old Norse. So, wow. Cause I, I can't, I know that most people won't know what it should sound like, but he went to the, Robert went to the trouble of researching it to write it properly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like it is absolutely incumbent upon me to speak it properly. For sure. At least to try. Yeah. So how long do you think that, how many hours do you think you might put into trying to sound Norse? Oh dear. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I hopefully not too many because, you know, you want to have a certain amount of speed mm-hmm. with the audio book. But uh, I, I think I would just have to, I, you know, I'll try and keep track of it and maybe tell you later. Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to know that, like to actually learn how to sound a little bit different, that, something that you haven't done before. That's got to be interesting. Mm-hmm. It is. Well, one thing I do know, um, I had read a book about creating languages. Uh, the guy who made... Um, uh, he wrote the language for Christopher Eccleston's character in Thor, the Dark World. Mm-hmm. And he's written the Dothraki language for Game of Thrones. And when I read that and it was talking about how different cultures, like they'll put the accent on different syllables. Mm-hmm. And so in Norse, what I'm finding, if I'm remembering this correctly, where they tend to put the accents on the first syllable of the word. Mm, okay. And we don't do that as often. Right. So it, it changes the rhythm. It, I think the biggest thing I'm noticing, because I'm, I'm also musical, and the rhythm of it is completely different from other languages or other accents that I've tried to imitate. Yeah. So I think just getting, getting the music of it in my ears is going to really help. Yeah, and it definitely is going to sound more harsh, probably, because of the accent on different parts of the word. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's so fascinating, though. Yeah, it is fascinating. It's like for me as an audiobook listener, I love to hear this stuff because I listen to so many audiobooks and the range of narrators is so broad. And it's like, wow. Mm. I mean, like one person can do one story and it sound this way and do another and sound completely different. And it's like, it's amazing to me. It's, I think you guys are amazing for being able to stretch your voices in that way. <laughs> Thank you. So as you prepare, to I guess or you kind of delved into narration kind of by accident but did you end up like listening to any audiobooks after or before you started being a narrator well the um it's funny this is now this is kind of fun when I uh first got the job I immediately got the audiobook that's the first one in the series um because the Starship Grifter series it starts with Starship Grifters Mm -hmm coincidentally. And uh, it was published and the publisher arranged, you know, through Audible for it, one of the greats, Kate Rudd, to do the narration. Mm-hmm. And she was fabulous. And it's very highly, I mean, she's, you know, multi-award winner. And, uh, and that was fabulous. But then Robert self-published the second book. Mm-hmm. And he could not afford Kate Rudd. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is, you know, how he ended up asking me so I needed to listen to kind of get the flavor, but I didn't listen to the whole thing because I didn't want to try to copy her. Yeah, You know, I, I wanted to, to give it a certain amount of consistency and yet without just trying to be her. Right. Because, you know, we knew if it worked out, I was going to be doing the rest of the series. And I just, you know, I needed to make it my own at the same time. Yeah. So I listened to some of that and then I, you know, I joined Audible 
because it's, you know, the loyal thing to do. And uh, so far, uh, right now I'm listening to um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci, mm-hmm. and uh, which there's some hysterical. So I did not expect it to be so funny, but uh, da Vinci was a nut. Yeah. <laughs> and um, see, then I got Fantastic Beasts for my kids. We've listened to that in the car. Yeah. And I, I could listen to Eddie Redmayne talk all day. So, um, And then uh, Stephen Fry's Sherlock Holmes. Oh, okay. And so I'm enjoying that one. But I, I don't get to listen a lot. Okay. Um, either we've got music going or if I'm editing, I can't listen to anything. Right. So. Do you have a favorite narrator that, like, of the books that you have heard on on audio, do you have one that kind of re- resonates with you that you like to listen to more? Like, whenever you see their name, okay, I'll, I'll take it. Right now, it would be Stephen Fry. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how, who would not like listening to Stephen Fry? Mm-hmm. But are, are you familiar with, you're familiar with I Stephen am, Fry, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. He's so, he's so marvelous. And that, I, I actually, that was my maiden name. So I like to pretend that we're related. <laughs> uh, <That's nice. laughs> we're not, as far as I know, I am not actually making that claim. Six degrees, six degrees. You never know. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm, I'm supposed to be British. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, I would like to listen to more Richard Armitage just because his voice is so rich. Mm-hmm. Um, but the only one I tried of him so far was a, a dramatic novel of Hamlet and because I love Shakespeare. And I didn't like what the author had done with the story, so I couldn't finish it. Wow. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm it happens. I'm sorry, author person. Sometimes <laughs> it happens, you know. It, I mean, to it be does. honest, I have recommended like audiobooks to people sometimes when they have to get a book done for book club or something and just reading it is painful. I'll say sometimes the, the, you know, the audio will help because the narrator will add a little something to it that pulls you in in a different way. (laughs) So, Mm, but sometimes even an awesome narrator can't save it. That's just the truth. Let's keep it real. (laughs) You, You know, Okay, well, let's listen to a little snippet of the title that you provided, which is Out of the Soylent Planet. And this is a prequel, right? Yes. But it's the second in the series, though. Third. Starship Grifters came first, was written first. Mm-hmm. Then I, Robot, which was the first book that I did. And then Out of the Soylent Planet goes back and tells you how Rex and Sasha first came to be the dynamic duo that they are. Okay, awesome. Let's take a listen. Gyanu slumbu goya nihalo, roared the Grabat. This translated roughly to, Your flesh will slowly dissolve inside the stomach of my beloved razor tooth churl, Nihalo. Look, I know you're upset, said Rex, but I was going to pay you, Burgoon. Yagan goya sulmbaga yanga slumbu goya. And I was going to let you remain on the outside of the razor tooth churl. I had a truckload of explosives I was going to pay you with, but there was a bit of an accident. Yanung samba ya gunga gumagangum, yama slumbu goya. You are about to have an accident in the belly of the razor tooth churl. At this point, I remembered I was supposed to tell Rex if Burgoon said anything about the churl, but I suspected I had missed my window. Okay, so we've heard the clip, and you've got to tell me a little bit about that language you were speaking. What what is it? (laughs) Well, it's it's Burgoon the Grabat, and he is kind of a crime lord. Um, basically Robert, one of the things that Robert does so beautifully is put a lot of pop culture references to classic sci-fi or, you know, books that he's loved, uh, films. There are nods to all sorts of things in his books. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a little treasure hunt. And so what, what, what's happening there is basically a spoof of Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, when you've got (laughs) C-3PO. (laughs) <laughs> negotiating okay. with Jabba the Hutt. Okay. And, you know, Han Solo lost the shipment. Uh, <laughs> um, 
so he just made up this this you know so i'm totally picturing myself as a big space slug while i'm doing it <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> yeah okay i can see it uh, now that you put he, that reference on it i could yes okay <laughs> yes absolutely and he put so many fun things in that book he he we had become friends by the time he was writing it and he knows I love Shakespeare. So there's a part in there where a lovesick robot gets to do an entire Shakespearean sonnet. Wow. Um, my mistress, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. <laughs> and um, wow. let's see. Sasha keeps fancying herself an actress and trying to do streetcar named desire. Um, but there's, there's references to Dune. There's plenty of star Wars. Um, I, I, I can't even name them all, wow. but, uh, you can, you can always, you can count on Robert for that in this series. He's a very flexible writer. So, uh, like the, the book that I'm narrating for him now is just hardcore sci-fi. It's very serious and intense and battles and explosions and swords and mayhem, but it's not silly at all. Mm-hmm. So he can really switch from genre to genre that way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, those grifters books there's a there's a lot going there's even there there are plants in that book there are plants that can talk and they really 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 like it when you pick their fruit oh oh my gosh (laughs) Uh, yeah okay (laughs) yeah moaning moaning plants tune in here folks it's all there (laughs) (laughs) headphones only moaning plants okay (laughs) I think it's still suitable for work, depending on where you work. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. It's, not, it's not Fifty Shades, Fifty Shades of Grey, or Fifty Shades of Green, or yeah. something like that. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Okay. So when you were <laughs> saying the language that you were in this um, clip, did you have a lot of that, or just like this small segment? Did you have a lot of that language to speak? Oh, well, it's just um, maybe like the last third of a chapter. Okay. So there's, there's, thank, thank goodness. There's just that one big conversation where Rex's fate is determined for that particular part of the book. Um, so now that was the only foreign language yeah. in that book, yeah. other than the moaning plant. <laughs> um, but, I can't even ask. but it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. <laughs> so did the writer come back and give you notes or did he just think, you know, you knocked it out the park first time, no notes on the language or no notes on the moaning plants, et cetera. <laughs> no, he, he generally, um, he's so busy. He churns out about four or five books a year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so he's usually up to his neck and his next project. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll send him a little snippet just to make sure. But he's he's been really easy to work with. And um, I'm trying to think, I think he dinged me once on one Spanish word because he he's fluent. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was one where I had gotten the accent wrong. And uh, so we fixed that. But uh, no, generally, he just turns me loose. Yeah, that's awesome. That's got to kind of be, I guess, the fun part of doing indie books is that you kind of have more freedom than you would, I guess, with maybe doing mm. a, a big publisher, maybe? Since I'm my own director and producer, then, yeah, it's it's a lot of freedom. I think it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit scary because, you know, you want, of course I want to please. And uh, feedback is great because then you know if someone's, you know, listening to all of it and telling you, yes, yes, you okay, fix this, then there's that more security that you know you're getting what they want. Right. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, I think, you know, the first book I was an absolute basket case. I'll be honest with you because I'd never done it before. Um, But now that we're kind of in a groove and, you know, he trusts me Mm -hmm. to turn out something he's going to like. So I just know with the um, with City of Sand and then now the Dream of the Iron Dragon, we just talked about the fact that I'm trying to pull back the voices some and make it more of just a classic narration because I don't want to distract from the seriousness of the story. So I'm just, I'm aiming, you know, I'm aiming to make the men sound like men and the women sound like women, Mm -hmm. but I'm not stressing over making everyone sound, you know, extremely distinct. Um, Plus, I'm not giving anyone, other than speaking the Old Norse, I'm not giving anyone accents because it would just get too complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, these these books are, it's a whole, I I don't quite know how to describe it, just lost myself. But uh, just to keep the focus on the action and not uh, distract with my own dramatics. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's that's what we're doing with this. Okay. Well, kind of speaking to that, like, okay, obviously this series that we're talking about today has, you know, a yes. humor to it. So how did you keep yourself oh, yeah. like laughing or something while you're recording if you find something funny or ridiculous? Like, how do you keep yourself in the zone instead of like just like bursting out? And how you pull yourself back if that happens? Well, um, I honestly, I wish I had made a blooper reel. I, I told him we ought to start like the next book. We ought to include a blooper reel as an extra chapter on the book um, because I don't always. I mean, sometimes I just lose it. And especially I'm more prone to laugh at my mistakes. You know, when a word gets hung up, um, the my language can get kind of colorful if I keep, <laughs> if I keep screwing something up. I, I, there are times I just would start making up dialogue. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I I just completely blew the word. I'm sorry. I've got to do something else now. (laughs) And um, but then I just, you know, go back and edit it all out. (laughs) But but I think mostly it had I'm trying to remember. I know there was one time where I got the giggles really badly. It might have been the moaning plants, you know, and then you might just have to leave the booth and go get a glass of water and, you know, come back. But uh, it hasn't been too hard. Oh, that's good. Because, I mean, just hearing the words moaning plants makes me laugh. I'm like, I, know. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is awesome. So, okay. So is there anything else you want to share with us about Out of the Soylent Planet? I, mm, I think I've hit. I mean, I don't want to give the plot away or, you know, anything else about it. The moaning, the, if, the, if the moaning plants don't get you... And the robot in love, then, uh, you know, what can I say? I know, right? It's, it's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> oh, well, it does have an unexpected dance party with the Bee Gees. What? Is there actual music so- <laughs> playing? <laughs> no, no. We figured that would be a, cop- a copyright <laughs> violation. <laughs> yeah, it might be. But but a classic, classic Bee Gees tune is referenced in this incredible work of science fiction artistry wow so awesome so bg fans so you're in for a treat wonderful <laughs> and shakespeare see it see it covers everything yeah it's it's culture that's what it is it's, <laughs> it's culture. culture that's nice <laughs> i love it <laughs> It is culture. And I got to say, this uh, cover art is very interesting, too. It's very different. So you definitely know you're going to get, mm-hmm. like, something funny out of this. So, for sure. Yes. And Robert did that himself. Okay. So he, he, he does his cover art. He's, 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 he's a talented person. Wow. Well, he did so. that himself. That looks really good. Good job, Robert. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. well thank you so much jennifer it's been a blast i had a wonderful time chatting with you thank you for coming on oh thank you so much oh absolutely so everyone you will find links for jennifer below in the show notes you will find links for her audiobooks and feel free to click on those and pick them up on audible and that's all for today take care everyone If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.